or you should start service by praying that somebody will ask Christ Jesus into their heart and their life. And then when they do that, we should celebrate with the angels of heaven. Amen. We should give a hand to the fact that it can happen. And so uh, I pray that uh, we'll help. Amen. We'll help. We'll be there. Need somebody to talk to. We'll be there. Uh, we may not always have all the money. We may not always have all the answers. But we got these two ears that God gave us for a reason and for a purpose. And if we can't do anything else, well, we can listen real good. We can listen real good. Because I'll tell you what, in looking at the title to the message today, uh, Discouraged. We are all trying to live a courageous life. We are all trying to uh, be courageous for our children. Be courageous for our wife. Be courageous for our husband. Be courageous for our community. Be courageous for our country. And unfortunately, that little word, kids use it all the time. Uh, I've, I've listened to my kids using, you know, hey man, why are you dissing me? What you diss me for, man? Why are you dissing me? I don't know. It took me a while to figure out what dissing was. And I found out that dissing was just the three little words that were a precursor to everything else, you know. Dismiss, disabled, discouraged, disgruntled. It's almost like it comes every time you put diss before something, it's negative, isn't it? Huh? And so why you dissing me, dog? Huh? Quit dismissing me all the time. But the devil is trying today to discourage you. He's trying to dismiss any courage that you have to live a Christian life. He's trying to dismiss and remove you from the love of Jesus. And if He can remove your courage, He can begin to weaken your strength. When He removes your strength, you're easy to whoop. You're easy to whoop. The devil's not looking for a battle oftentimes. He fights a lot of them. But he likes that easy prey. You know what I mean? Kind of like a shark that smells blood in the water. That's the way the devil is. Uh, he just swims about, always toiling, never stopping, always moving, always going, always looking for something to kill. And then what do we do? We do stupid things that cut our flesh. And then we do an even dumber thing. We jump into the water with a fish that can smell a drop of it from a quarter of a mile away and expect him not to eat us. We take those risks every day. The shark example may seem uh, ridiculous, but have you been to the beach lately? They say shark populations are increasing and people are still swimming with them. Why? Because their love for the water is greater than their dislove for sharks. I get it. But you know, it can, the same principle can apply to alcohol. Huh? I love alcohol far more than I don't love it. I like the way it makes me feel. I like losing my inhibitions. I, I think I even sing better when I drink. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's, a lot of good, there, you know, there's a lot of good qualities if you were just sit down and talk with me that I could list that alcohol benefits my life. Discouraged. Discouraged. So, in talking about oceans and talking about fish, before the whole 2020 shutdown took place, many of you may have seen this and you may not have. I remember the first movie I ever saw at a drive in theater. It's way back in the, the early 70s. You want to know what it was? It was Orca. The Killer Well. I remember being over at the, I don't know if it was the first one, but I remember it was the first impactful movie that I had seen as a small child. I had hurt myself. My knee was all swollen. I'd fell out of the back of a truck. My leg was propped up in between the console of my sister's sunbird. 
as I sat there and I watched Orca, the killer whale. It became such a fascinating movie because little did I know even back then that my ADHD was so great that I would go on an absolute tangent to find out as much as I could about killer whales after that movie. So much unnecessary information and facts that I have, I could blow you away with killer whales and I don't even live close to an ocean. I don't know whether you've realized it or not, uh, but Monroe Lake is about the biggest body of water that we got here in the state of Indiana. Uh, and I know more about orca uh, than most people in the scientific field probably do. Do you know that when an orca has a baby that its fetus, when it's in the womb, that it actually, where its fins will come out on its feet and its hands? Do you know that when it's a, a, a fetus in its mother's womb, uh, that those fins look like fingers and toes? It almost, except for the head size, it almost looks like a human fetus inside an orca killer. Why wouldn't it? It's a mammal, right? You say, it's a mammal. Yeah, it drinks milk from its mother. It's not a fish. It's a porpoise. It's a fish. It's a, what is it? Who knows? So many terms. So confused by so much. We can become so discouraged by so many different things. But when uh, thinking about that killer well, I was reminded during the whole COVID lockdown in 2019, there was a lot of things going on about killer wells and stuff. There had been a movie come out called Blackfish, and it had talked about the captivity of killer wells and all the problems that was created by companies like SeaWorld and the captivity of these ginormous, ginormous uh, fish. That's what I'll call them, a fish. Um, but at that same time in 2019, this is where I'm going with this, okay, there was a well called Taliqua. Taliqua, the killer well. They began to follow uh, Taliqua, the killer well, because she had gave birth and Taliqua's pod of killer wells were in danger. Her newborn was their hope for the future. But the calf lived for less than an hour. Now you say, well, Reno, that's sad. Why is that? Why is that such an important part of this story that you're going to talk to us about in this message called Discouraged Today? Because tequila, or not tequila, te tequila, however you pronounce the killer whale's name, do you know why she became of national interest on the news? Because for the next 17 days, Taliqua, the killer well, would push her dead infant orca around in the cold waters of the Pacific Ocean before she would let it go. 17 days, she kept that fish afloat and pushed it around in the Pacific Ocean. 17 days. I believe an orca mourned for the loss of its baby. You see, we're more in touch and more in tune with things than what you think we are. I may not be a tree hugger. Uh, I'm not going to go out and say things, but I'm not going to purposely just kill things that I have a connection with either. You can go both ways, folks. You can think about things rationally. You don't have to be so radical and fanatical that you become a discouragement to everybody else. Just live your life. Encourage yourself and encourage others and see what a blessing it is because just like Taliqua, folks, there may not be a killer well moving their young through the waters of our life right now, but there are all kinds of people who are trying to keep their life afloat, to keep things going. And they are absolutely discouraged. I just gave you an example just a while ago. A six-year-old diagnosed with leukemia you think that grandmother who's in a hospital in Chicago that helps take care of that child, you think that she doesn't want anything more? She's actually, she is literally telling the doctors at this point that you have to let me out of here. I have to go. I have responsibilities to take care of. You know why? Because just like Taliqua, she wants to get under that baby and lift him up 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 where air is at where you can breathe the oxygen, where you can see God. I believe Taliqua was taking that baby and just believing. Just believing, no, oh, what I do? It's tragic. I'm discouraged. And discouragement will make us do the craziest things. Won't it? 
Won't it? Don't you all lie to me this morning. Don't you all not amen me this morning and make me feel like I'm the only one that's been through this because I'm not. As a matter of fact, when my daddy died at 18 years old, I reaped the consequences of those poor decisions for the next 26 years. Carried that discouragement with me in my heart. Really probably just needed somebody to help me along the way, but too often in life, folks, we don't get that opportunity. There wasn't other killer whales that were helping Taliqua keep her little lifeless baby afloat. It was just Taliqua left to deal with her problems all by herself. Been there? Oh, yeah. I've been in that bedroom down there on 15th Street, curled up in a ball many, many times. In my bedroom with the door closed and the windows shut, just hiding from the world. Discouraged, hurt, broken, devastated. I'm glad I'm not in that position anymore. I'm glad I'm not there now. But unfortunately, even as a Christian, we, tie, we try all kinds of things to deal with the discouragement that we have in our life. Just because I'm a preacher doesn't mean that uh, I, I'm not accepting of trying other things to release myself from this discouragement and this pain that I feel. I feel it too! Just like you do. My stomach turns inside out. I feel like I'm going to throw up. My heart aches. Tears run down my face. I'm not just some hard-nosed idiot that sits up here and screams week in and week out. I live life too. And oftentimes life can be discouraging. And oftentimes the discouragement that we face makes us want to throw in the towel, give up, quit. But we listen to that song about the voice of truth and God is always crying out to us and God is always trying to be our encouragement and God is wanting us to know that hey he gave us a whole book called Lamentations it's about people just weeping and crying over the losses that they've experienced folks if we didn't do nothing but just shared our discouragement that we've had in just the last couple of years, just over loss of people. Just the last few years. Every one of you, I could go through this room and talk about a connection that you've had with somebody that has been very painful for you to go through just in the last few years. A Robin sticking out. She lost her daddy. Ron was a great guy. I love him with all my heart. He was one of the funniest men that I ever met in my life. But Robin has to deal with the discouragement that life has to go on uh, despite people that we love are not in it anymore. Can you guys tell my mouth is dry? It was. I felt like I'd smoked a big doobie. <laughs> Look at the attention I got then. Everybody's like, Reno, the kids are in here. Huh? Huh? Everybody perked up and paid attention. We'll talk about doobies a lot more of them. Um, so, that being said, I've got to get into this day. Just let me give you the Word of God today. I want to talk to you about discouragement. I want to talk to you. Uh, I wanted to share with you about Taliqua because I think Taliqua the killer well was a painting of how we suffer sometimes. Sometimes God has removed some things from our life, but we are continually trying to keep it afloat because it's painful to let it go. But sometimes the things that we have to let go, regardless of how you look at it, they are part of what God's plan is in our life. Release it and move on. You see, Taliqua can never bring life into this world as long as she is pushing and pursuing a dead life that she's discouraged in carrying. 
And some of you, we are like that with our own lives. We're just like Taliqua. God said, I'll give you a new life in Christ Jesus. I will liberate you from the pain, the sorrow, the sickness, the suffering, all the things that you are inclined to face that are negative in this world. I can help release you of those through my son, Christ Jesus. More like, eh. I mean, sounds good, but I'd rather hold on to this old dead man. This old dead Reno. He ain't doing much anymore. He's lifeless. Huh? His body's wanting to sink. Huh? But I just want to keep him alive a little bit longer. I want to hold on to him in case this church thing goes bad, Mimo. Because I know what's effective and I know what works. Outside of Jesus, I can get angry, I can become mad, I can be an alcoholic, I can push my will around. I can get some of the stuff that I want to get. I can pursue some of the stuff that I want to pursue. And I can do it out of alcoholism and out of anger. Or drug addiction or whatever. But I'm trying to keep this dead body alive because Josh, it's all I've ever known. And when push comes to shove, if I've let this go... It's sinking to the bottom of the ocean, and I can't get there, brother. I can't swim that deep. I cannot get to it. But do you know that's what God wants us to do, Jason Regal? He wants us to let go of that old man. He's dead. He's dead to leave. Well, let him go. Let him sink to the bottom of the ocean. You'll never forget him. But you won't be burdened with carrying him around. And in doing so, to Lequa, you can get back to living life and given life to the world that you live in because as long as you are lifting and carrying your dead baby from the murks and the darkness of the ocean and trying to push them to do you, are you hearing me today church do you know what pastors spend all their time doing <laughs> just trying to hold people up to the surface a little bit longer come on get a breath come on get a breath come on get a breath Come on, breathe! I can't hold you here much longer. We're both going to drown. Get a breath. And then after you get that breath, come on, swim along with me. Swim along beside me and learn how to make it through this current. Let me show you, let me show you where the tide flows. And you can get in that tide and ride it easily. Or you can swim against it all your life and never get anywhere. Just push and push and push against the tide of life. That's what we all do. We all do it. We become discouraged because we don't get things the way we want them. We don't have things the way we want it. We shed tears. We have sorrow. But God is still the voice of truth that is calling out to us. And so in the Word of God today, in the book of Lamentations as we talk about uh, this I wanted to read this to you in verses uh, 48 through 66 in the third chapter. Verse 48 says, Streams of tears flow from my eyes because my people are destroyed. Now I'm reading out of the NIV today and you guys are going to be seeing the King James Version of the Bible posted up here. But just pay attention. Listen and read the Word today and let it settle in with you. My eye runneth down with rivers of water for the destruction of of the daughter of my people. And the NIV just simply uh, cleans that up and says, streams of tears flow from my eyes because my people are destroyed. My eyes, in verse 49, will flow unceasingly without relief. Verse 50 says, until the Lord looks down from heaven and sees, verse 51, what I see brings grief to my soul because of all the women of my city. Verse 52, those who were my enemies without cause hunted me like a bird. They tried to end my life in a pit and threw stones at me. The waters closed over my head and I thought I was about to be cut off. Verse 55 says, I called on your name, O Lord, from the depths of the pit. I called on you, Lord, when I was at the bottom of the ocean, when I had done sunk and there was nowhere left to turn. I didn't have enough air to get me back to the surface. But somebody had told me in February of 1998, three days before Valentine's Day, they said, Reno, you don't have to live with this weight that keeps sinking you. You can be free of it. 
if you just ask Jesus into your heart and into your life. Josh, I've tried everything else. You know how many rehabs I've been to? You know how many facilities, how many psychologists and psychiatrists have counseled me, talked to me? I mean, I am crazy, certifiably. I have it on paper. I know that that's a joke that everybody likes to tell, but I'm serious. I've got it on paper. I'm crazy and know I'm crazy. I've said so often, it's the advantage I have over the rest of the world. Y'all are crazy, you just don't know it. I'm crazy and know I'm crazy. It's the advantage I have over all you lunatics. <laughs> you know what my first shirt's going to be when I print it up, Brian? It's going to say... I'm crazy, you're crazy, we're all crazy. It's not a competition. It's not a competition to see who can show their craziness off. And yet we treat it like it is that in the world that we live in today. And so when we read that passage of Scripture, again in verse uh, 55, I called on your name, O Lord, from the depths of the pit. You heard my plea. Don't close your ears to my cry for relief. Verse 57 says... You came near when I called you. You said, do not fear. You remember that song that we just sang? The voice of truth tells me a different story. The voice of truth says, do not be afraid. That's what God's telling us today, church. We don't have anything to, be, to, to fear. You don't have anything to be afraid of today. You don't have to worry about what other men are saying and thinking because they're not the ones that are going to control your eternal destiny. God is. We spend all of our time trying to stay afloat in a world that's trying to sink us rather than call on the life savior that is Christ Jesus and say, God, I can't make it. I can't paddle anymore. I don't have anybody to support me anymore. When I thought about Talik, when I thought about that little well sinking to the bottom, Patty, I thought about my mom. I thought about how long she lifted me up, how many times she boosted me up, how many times she pushed me to the surface because she believed in her heart of hearts that I wasn't dead and that I should live. And so she fought for my life. I watched Maria as a single mother with those five little girls back there. And girls, let me tell you something. The rest of them are babies. But young lady, you're old enough. You can know it. Your mama's fighting for you. To keep you all afloat. Help her out. Tell her you love her. Put your arms around her neck. Encourage her. Because there are fights that she's fighting that you guys will never know. There's battles that she's going through that you'll never know. Why? Because she don't want you to know them. My kids here recently talk about discouraging. My kids, uh, they always want to know what's going on. And we're like anybody else. We have arguments and fights and financial problems and all those kinds of things. One of the things that I've always told my kids is they're always nosy. They always say, well, what are you and mom fighting about? What are you and mom fighting about? What's your business? What's your business what we're fighting about? Well, maybe I can help. Well, you can. You cannot help other than shut your mouth and clean your room. You say that all the time. Well, it's because it's what I want all the time for you to shut your mouth and clean your room. That's it. It's a little requirement. It's not big. One of them just requires this. And the other one requires this. That's it. I love my kids, and they know it, and they, they often ask, they, they, they often ask, they say, well, what's going on? And I've always, this has always been a rule of thumb in our house. I've always told this to my wife, I always tell this to my kids, it's still a rule of thumb. Uh, they know more now than they ever have, but we've never openly discussed our financial problems in front of our kids. Never when the lights are about to shut off or the water is about to be turned off or the mortgage is about to be closed. We've never talked about that in front of our kids because our financial problems are not their problems. They don't need to be burdened with those problems. They need to be burdened with getting the education that they have. They need to be burdened with digging in the books and doing the things that they're supposed to be doing. They need to be burdened with what's going on in their life and taking care of the little things that they need to take care of in their life. Amen. Me and mom's just there to keep pushing them up, keep taking them to the surface. We're not here to bog you down and to drag you down with the darkness that is really the world that you're about to walk into. You'll find out soon enough. We are preparing you for it. 
by not sharing with you some of the things that you were so eager to find out about. It's dark. It's discouraging. Goes on, Dale, can I skip? Uh, let's skip to, uh, let's just skip to verse 66 and it says this. In talking about wanting vengeance and wanting revenge and we read in the Word of God uh, as we look at the book of Lamentations and verse 66 says, Pursue them in anger and destroy them from under the heavens of the Lord. And that's the way we feel when we are discouraged is that if you listen to the voice of discouragement, then you can never hear the voice of truth. And so we want that verse, we want that verse uh, 57, you came near when I called you and you said, do not be a fear, do not fear. We, we want to sing that song in our hearts that says, do not be afraid. But the fact of the matter is that life dictates and determines every day the fears that we are facing. Many of you, you have fears just like I do. Hey, do you know what my battle's been this week? Do you want me to tell you? I told my wife, I said, I don't have any friends. I don't. I don't have any friends. I don't have anybody to hang out with. Because people can't relate to me. And I can't be my real self in front of them. Because every time I do, they stab me in the back and they go tell somebody else. And then people start leaving my church. And people start accusing me of not being a Christian. And I shouldn't be in leadership. And Oh man, it's a mess. So do you know what I elected to do? I just don't have no friends. And I'm alright with that. I'm alright with that. Because in not having any friends in this world, I found out that I got a friend that is closer than a brother. When I've shut everybody else's voices out, guess who comes through loud and clear? Jesus. I found out that it's good to have friends. But I don't have to listen to all the counsel that they give all the time. Because it just adds to the confusion and all the voices that are already running around a million miles an hour in my head. I don't need that. Sometimes I need somebody to be a little more encouraging than discouraging. You ever get into the conversations where you have the discouragement competition? Huh? Aren't those fun? When somebody asks you how you're doing and it was a setup? They didn't really care how you were doing. They just wanted you to quickly say, I'm fine, so that they could say, oh, well, <laughs> let me tell you about the hell I'm living. Yes, sir, sit down. This is going to take a while. <laughs> but I told you before we started that I got to pee. Now. They don't care, do they? Huh? And then you sit through a half hour of that, and don't you feel better when you leave? I'll tell you what most of you do, and you're liars if you say you don't. You walk away going, wow. Good Lord. Some of you even look at your spouse as you're walking away and go, huh? So easily discouraged and yet God's trying to be an encourager to us and <clears throat> as we get ready to wind this down today I was thinking about you know what we listen to the voice of discouragement so much that we can never hear the voice of truth that we long for we listen to the voice of discouragement so much that it completely clouds out the voice of Jesus that we are trying to hear and that's why we are often confused as to whether or not it's God telling something to us or not. Could you imagine if David would have listened to the discouragers throughout his life? God said, David's a man after my own heart. What an encouraging thing for God to say to you. Good thing. Because David lived a reckless life. 
If God wouldn't have told David that, I guarantee he'd still been going to rehabs and lock up. We'd still been reading his name and the facts on file. But because, because the discouragers were everywhere. Remember Job that we talked about Wednesday night? Boy, that poor guy, even his wife, huh? God removed everything from his life except one nagging wife. Killed his kids. Well, he didn't kill his kids, but his kids died, his livestock. But he left that wonderful woman by his side that said, Job, why don't you just curse yourself and die? Thanks, baby. It's wonderful to be in a house full of encouragement. We read that and we think about that. I think about it anyway. I think about David and Goliath. And if David would have gave in to discouragement, think about that David and Goliath story, how different that would have been because that started out of discouragement. That started with him just being a shepherd boy bringing food to his brothers to help strengthen them and prepare them for battle. But there was this one loud mouth that just kept saying discouraging things and everybody else's ears closed to it. You know what I'm saying? You do it too. You do it in your own home. When somebody's trying to talk to you, when your kids are trying to relate to you, when your wife's trying to speak to you, you have the ability to shut it off. I do too. And everybody was shutting it off except for one little ruddy shepherd boy named David. And David was listening. And David didn't like what the giant was spewing out. And so when the discouraging comments were coming, when Goliath was standing there in all his size and all his prowess, he said, Come on, you little ruddy punks! Somebody come fight a real man! And they were all so discouraged that they went and they hid behind the trees, probably without even as much as their lunch. But David, David said, If my God be for me, who can be against me? Today, giant, I'll have your head. Today, devil, you're mine. Today, devil, you're defeated in the name of Jesus. And David took the only thing that he had, that one smooth stone, and with just a little bit of encouragement that he couldn't get from his brothers, he couldn't get it from his enemy, he certainly couldn't get it from the crowd that was looking on, but he had one encouraging voice. And it was the voice of truth. It was the voice of God Almighty. And not only did the voice give David the strength to run to the giant with nothing more than a smooth stone, but the same God that gave him the strength and encouraged him to do it was the same God that planted that rock right between the giant's eyes and dropped him. And you read on in the story and it says that David stood over that giant and they said, here's his sword, here's his shield. Here's his helmet. David said, I can't use any of that junk. But he took off his head. I think about Moses. What about you? Yeah, listen to this. Moses had the entire congregation of Israel discouraging him constantly. And do you know what that discouragement did to Moses because he listened to it and he let it prevail so often in his life? We get most of the Old Testament because the Israelites wandered around a mountain for 40 years moaning and groaning and complaining. When they were literally a day and a half by foot's journey to the land of promise that they would receive. But instead, discouragement just kept them traveling in circles, running around the mountain. Now, I know you're getting sleepy, and I know I need to close today. Uh, but I think that we need to cry out to God today, not because we've lost hope. Uh, but we need to cry out to Him because we believe He's listening. We act like He's not listening anymore. We act like that the whole world's going to hell in a handbag and God's not listening to everybody. No, God's still listening. We're not talking. We're allowing all the discouragement of this world 
to quiet us in our conversation with our holy and erring infallible God. And so, naysayers and backbiters are everywhere. Let me give you this real quickly in 1 Corinthians, uh, yes, chapter 1, verse 27. I want to remind you of something that God doesn't recruit uh, from a pedestal, but from the pit. God's not looking to recruit people that are standing on the mountaintop singing his praise. God's looking to recruit people that are down and out just like you and I. He did it all throughout his word. In verse 27 in 1 Corinthians says, But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Verse 28 says, He chose the lowly things of this world and despised the things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. Little boy said, uh, if I could remember how it goes, he said, God's not finished with me yet. God's not finished with me yet. He said, I'm like a, a, a loaf of bread that's been put in the oven. The heat is on and it's completely surrounding me. But one day God's going to open the door and when he pulls me out, he's going to say, ah, well done my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of the Lord. Isn't that what we all want? Then let's encourage others to receive the th same thing. Robbie, if there's anything that I can do today, brother, that prayer made my day. And so, in light of that, I want you to understand that it's not just me. Pick up one of them black books back there on your way out. It's got everybody. If you, if you don't have your phone number in there yet, get it listed in there, folks. See Deanna. She's waving at you. She's holding Everett right now. And get your name put in that black book. Because you never know when somebody like Robbie, I may not be around for him to call. And he may just need to call anybody. Wouldn't it be nice to know that your number's in there? That's so funny right now. There's a little boy that's going to get discouraged here real quick in a minute. <laughs> uh, I'm getting ready to let you guys go. I've kept you too long with the kids up here. Let me read you this last verse. We'll go, that, we'll, we'll go eat. Amen? Amen? It says here in 2 Corinthians, in chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. Verse 10 says, That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, insults, and hardships, and persecutions. And difficulties. Can y'all read that with me? For when I am weak, then am I strong. Because when you are weak, Christ's strength will prevail in you and through you. But when you are trying to do it all in and of yourself, don't be surprised when the discouragement comes. Get out from underneath the discouragement and get around Christ Jesus who will put you around the people that will encourage you in a life that's already a struggle. Amen? Stand with me today. I don't know if I got that out the way I was supposed to, but I know this, that God's always listening and you can be sure that God will look down from heaven and see you. How can you practice bringing all your emotions to God? When have you felt God draw near to you in your sadness? Oh, loving God, help us to remember that it's right to lament wrongness. It's okay to cry. It's okay that Discouragement has its place in the world that we live in. But God, you told us that we were more than conquerors through Christ Jesus that lives in us. And so Lord, we're asking today that you'll strengthen us 
through such a discouraging time that we are living in. Father, it's hard to be hopeful when so many need help. Father, it's, it's hard. It's hard to be loving in such a confused world. Father, I don't know how to end all the confusion. I mean, I know You're the way. You're the truth. You're the life. You're what we need. But God, even I get discouraged in that I don't know how to give You to everybody. I wish I did. Nonetheless, I love You, Lord. I'm going to entrust You to encourage me all the days of my life. That when the naysayers and the backbiters and the discouragers come, and they will, I'm going to continue to press on to the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. And I'm going to do it because your son Christ Jesus pressed onto the cross and died for me. Through the discouragement, through the pain, through the toil, he went to the cross and gave his life for mine. And for that, forever thankful today, Lord. We'll praise you. We'll thank you. Bless the food that we're about to take in. Let the fellowship be even more blessed. And we'll give you thanksgiving and praise always in Jesus' name. Amen. Go eat, y'all. Good to see you. This